part of us and that we rejoice in your joining our worship service. We're going to take some time now to minister in prayer, and as we pray, every person is a minister, whether you're speaking out loud or inwardly. This is a time for you to intervene and pray for folks that uh, are on your heart. So we'll take a few moments for silent prayer, then I'll take a few moments to lead in public prayer, and we'll conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, right now, every one of us has been picturing someone in our hearts. We've been thinking about people who are standing in need. Father, we're so grateful that we can come to you as your children, we can rely upon you to hear and answer our prayers. These things would pretty easily consume us with worry if we had to bear them on our own. So you have given us the privilege of laying them down as burdens. And you will bear them for us. You will bring cures. You will bring relief. You will bring prosperity when those things are your will. We are not to misinterpret any gap in time between our prayers and your response. Because sometimes your answer to us is that we need to wait. We need to cultivate the spiritual discipline of waiting on you. And even though it is you, Lord, waiting is still hard for us. So we need to fill that waiting time with worship. We need to fill that waiting time with scripture. We need to fill that waiting time with time spent in fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, I know how hard it is to arrange that fellowship. But it is so very much a blessing. And you call us also to fill that waiting time with service and witness. Service to those in need and witness to those who don't know you. And that may be the same person in the same situation in the same moment. You reveal to us opportunities by your Spirit. And often those opportunities come at a time when we are distracted, when we are in the middle of a plan, an appointment, we stack our days so heavily. Lord, give us wisdom to know 
when you have an appointment for us, when an opportunity arises to be of service, to have fellowship, to witness, to pray, to read scripture, that we need to drop what we thought we needed to do and be obedient. Then, Father, we'll see the biblical promises of joy and peace. We'll see justice flow like a never-ending stream. We will see people change. And when we see people change, we will see communities change and countries change for the better this time. Lord, we, we look around, and if we look too closely at the news, too closely at what people are trying to say is important when it isn't, we can easily lose heart. So my prayer this morning, Father, is for us to be fortified in our hearts, to be strengthened in our resolve, to have a clarity of focus as we follow you, Jesus. And to look no further than the back of your head. To desire nothing more than to be behind you, following you, stepping in your footsteps. Because we know if we follow and the closer that we follow, the more likely it is we are right where you want us to be. Father, for these friends who are hearing my voice, I ask these things in Jesus' name. Hear us as we pray now the words of Christ who prayed. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And we have a trio this morning including Helen Peters, Val Thompson, and Sharon Hoover. I heard them practicing earlier. You're in for a blessing. <clears throat>
reminder, do you have a place of prayer in your home? Do you have a go-to place that you can be quiet before the Lord? Jesus told us to go into our closet and in the King James Version, but that's really what he's talking about, is that, that little place of prayer that the lady sang. We are going to take our Bibles now, having been blessed in these many ways, and turn to the Word of God. Luke chapter 17, starting with verse 20. Luke 17, starting with verse 20. Once, having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation. Nor will people say, Here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. Then he said to his disciples, the time uh, is coming when you will long to see the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. Men will tell you, there he is, or here he is. Do not go running off after them. For the Son of Man in his day will be like lightning, which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also it will be in the days of the Son of Man. Many people were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the roof of his house with his goods inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife? Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken, and the other left. Where, Lord? they asked. He replied, Where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. On this somber note from our Lord, let us pray that uh, we understand these words of Christ, Keep them ourselves and help others to do the same. I was meeting with a friend of mine recently. We were having a wonderful piece of uh, caramel apple pie with ice cream. And there were songs playing on the intercom, you know, and sometimes the manager turns up the music just a little too loud. And I was concentrating on what Larry was saying because I wanted to, to hear him and have a good conversation. So I was trying to ignore the music. And I was surprised to find that I, as I was ignoring the music, I actually heard the lyrics for the very first time. Now this is a very old song. It, was, it came out as a single in 1970. Its title is, Does Anybody Know What Time It Is? by the group Chicago. Are you with me yet? The song starts out, I was walking down the street one day, 
And for some reason, after that little trumpet solo, I stopped hearing the words normally. I didn't know there really were lyrics. I thought just gibberish. <laughs> but when I listened, I heard a man came up to me and asked me what the time was on my watch. Yeah. <laughs> I heard that. I didn't know the name of the song, but I had heard it so many times since 1970. You probably have too. And I'm just getting into the trumpet parts, into the, the light, happy flow of the music, and I'm not listening for any kind of message. I didn't really even know there were words to this song. So in the second verse, a pretty lady, I was walking down the street one day, that's the part that you hear clearly. A pretty lady looked at me and said her diamond watch had stopped cold dead. And she wanted to know the time. And in the third verse, I was walking down the street run one day, being pushed and shoved by people, trying to beat the clock. Oh no, I just don't know. And the theme of this song is that rush of activity, the preciousness of time, and people being in the midst of their their, uh, their activity, their lives, their, their hamster wheel, and not really stopping to pay attention. I thought, wow, that's a pretty good illustration of what Jesus is saying here in Luke chapter 17. He says there's a time coming when the Son of Man is going to be revealed, and before that time, people are going to be doing their thing. They're going to be wondering what time it is. They're going to be immersed in their daily activities, but then suddenly Jesus appears and all of that comes to an end, a grinding halt. They would be surprised to find Jesus' warnings and promises were true. Just like the people of the song, this upbeat musical song, they will vividly, in contrast, miss out and have the tragic realization it's too late. Now, verse 20 supplies the context. Here, the Pharisees are coming to Jesus and asking questions. And in the Gospels, when the Pharisees are asking Jesus questions, it's usually for the purpose of entrapment. And their question to him was, uh, let me say it exactly. When the kingdom of God would come. There in verse 20. Here is Jesus' answer. The kingdom of God will come suddenly, but not unexpectedly. Now those aren't the words of Jesus. It's a summary of the teaching of Jesus here. Suddenly, but not unexpectedly because promises have been made warnings have been given being prepared now two things first of which the kingdom is here the kingdom of God is here and even more startling it is within you you as people of faith are citizens of God's kingdom right now. And so Jesus said to the Pharisees that the kingdom of God does not come about because of your careful observation. He's saying to them, you don't get to say when the kingdom comes. You don't get to say what the kingdom is. None of us do. Our job is to prepare ourselves and those we love, those around us, for that day. We don't decide when it comes, but we do get to observe it. And how do we observe the kingdom of God as it is present right now? We observe it in one another. Wow. Jesus told his disciples not to pay attention to people who claim to see the kingdom in one place or the other, because it's not there or here, it's here. 
At the moment, the kingdom of God exists in God's people. It comes to us directly and individually. It is the ultimate grassroots movement of all. The paradox of the kingdom is that it is here, but it is also coming. And that's our second point. We've observed the kingdom is here. Now, let's observe that it is coming. And we're not to be surprised by its coming. Look at verses 22 through 37. Jesus warned them in verses 22 to 25 that it would come after, sometime after, he suffered ultimate rejection. Jesus would first suffer ultimate rejection. He understood the desire of his disciples to see the days of the Son of Man, but warned them they would not, that the event would come after their lifetimes. He warned them that there would be false sightings and warned them in advance not to believe those who said they had seen him. And they would know that the sightings would be false because when Jesus did come again, it would be in a way that would be unmistakable to every human being on the face of the planet. He described it like lightning that flashes from one side to the other side. Not, not little bolts, but a big crash of thunder, bolt of lightning that illuminates the night as if it were day. That's obvious. But first he would suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Now don't be fooled by that word generation. It doesn't refer to the people who are alive at that time. It refers to the people starting with them and continuing to our time and to that future time when Jesus comes again. All of us one generation in a very broad sense. Then Jesus offered a couple of biblical, historical examples of people who were caught unaware by sudden but expected destruction. Verses 26 to 29. One of them is Noah. Noah was building a boat. There had never been rain. There was not any water. No need for a boat. Certainly no apparent need for one so big. And during the hundred and, I think, twenty years that he was building that boat, Noah was telling people, why are you building the boat, Noah? Destruction's coming. A flood's coming. What's a flood, Noah? Well, let me explain it to you. And life carried on as normal among those people. Up until the day Noah walked up the plank, got on the boat and God shut the door behind him. Water began to fall and continued until all of the unrepentant evil people had been destroyed. A second example is that of Lot, Abraham's nephew. He lived in a place called Sodom. And these people were engaged in business. Do you notice in the verse that it they're just buying and selling, they're eating and drinking, they're doing the stuff that all of us do, just normal everyday chamber of commerce kind of stuff, until God got Lot out of the city. And then fire and sulfur from heaven rained destruction upon the city. And even the chamber of commerce burned. It was all gone. It's all the evil and the unrepentant. They had been warned. They had been told. They had been called to repent, but stubbornly refused. And friends, here's the tragic part of what Jesus is saying to us, is that when he comes again, opportunities to be saved will cease. There will be no more opportunities to join the kingdom when it becomes obvious. Look at verses 30 to 37. This history of Noah and Lot will repeat itself. There will be people in this generation as we've defined it 
who are going to go about life and oblivious to the warnings, unheeding the promises, and though they know better, they will be caught unawares. They will be surprised that what Jesus promised came true. And then it will be too late to retrieve their goods. It will be too late to come down from the roof or from the field and get their stuff, which won't do them any good anyway. Don't do that, Jesus said. Don't be like Lot's wife who, who turned around as she fled from the city of Sodom and, and whom God turned instantly into a pillar of salt. Don't be that person. Don't look back to the old life. Don't try to salvage or save your treasures in this world, but instead be willing to part with them. Verse 33 is the key verse. Let's read it again to remind us of what it says. Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. That's why we don't go down from the roof or come back from the field. We gave all that stuff up. It meant nothing to us anymore. We leave it to be destroyed in order to avoid being destroyed ourselves. Then in verses 34 to 35, Jesus describes one effect of this sudden but anticipated second coming. He says two people will be in a bed. One of them will be taken and the other left. Two people will be working. One of them will be taken and the other left. Then the disciples want to know where. And we're not told exactly what group they're referring to. The people taken or the people left. Until we come to verse 37. Jesus says where there is a dead body the vultures gather. So clearly he's telling them what happens to those left behind. That only death and destruction await them, but life eternal for those who have prepared for his coming. Friends, the kingdom of God will come suddenly, but not unexpectedly. Now way back in 1995, a lady named Diane Franzen of Carson City, Nevada, wrote about a personal experience she had with her son, and I quote, As a harried young mother of a five-year-old and an infant, I was kept busy with the mundane tasks of housekeeping and child care. One day, the work had piled up and I was frantically running and scrubbing and dusting while my son pestered me to play with him. Not now, son, I'm busy, I said throughout the day. Finally, my son sauntered into the kitchen, head hung low, and asked me one last time to play with him in his most forlorn voice. I pulled my sudsy hands out of the dishwater and wrestled him to the kitchen floor, tickling and laughing. When we settled down to catch our breath, he looked up at me and calmly said, Mom, you should play with me more, because when I'm ten, I'm not going to want to play with you. That was a dose of realism, wasn't it? Opportunity is a finite resource. You hear me, church? Opportunity, they say, knocks once. You may get lucky and get a second knock, but it is a limited resource. And though we are warned, we sometimes get surprised when opportunities run out. 
And to me, this passage is about the worst of all missed opportunities. The opportunity to be saved. Though we know Jesus is coming again, we don't know when it will be. We can't waste our days on trivialities alone. We must be intentional about seeing the opportunities the Holy Spirit gives us and take advantage of them to draw people to Jesus. When the vultures appear, then it's too late, even for regrets. A word to the wise. Someone say amen. amen. We're going to take our songbooks now, conclude our service by standing and singing number 79. We want to invite anyone who wants to take a step of faith this day to follow Jesus. Uh, come as we sing, speak to us later. We're happy to help. Uh, 79, let's do one, two, and four. Okay? Would you stand? Let's tell Jesus we love him as we sing it. Let's be.